This is Ask Lisa, a podcast to help people understand the psychology of parenting now in the midst of a pandemic. Psychologist Dr. Lisa Demore, author of two New York Times bestselling parenting books, takes your questions. And I'm co host Rena Ninen, a journalist and mom of two. Some of what we talk about comes from raising children ourselves. Most of the time, I'll be getting answers to your parenting questions. So send your questions to Ask Lisa at drlisademore.com. Episode 11 When is it time to worry about an eating disorder? I know we spend so much time on this podcast talking about food, one of our favorite topics. <laughs> but, you know, it got me thinking. I know eating disorders are actually a specialty of yours, which is remarkable. You are so knowledgeable about it. I love, I, you know, food has given us a great deal of comfort. We've done a podcast on food. Um, when is it time to worry that you might have an eating disorder? Oof. I'm glad we're talking about this. I think there's... It's something we want to be watching really closely right now. I think for a lot of people, adults and kids, their relationship with food feels a little wonky right now. We got a letter from a mom, and she talks about this with her daughter that she's concerned about. She says, hello, Dr. Lisa. My 17-year-old daughter has been under some stress lately, which I thought was mainly due to lockdown and being a senior in high school and having to make so many life-changing decisions But it turns out that she's been stressing over her body image. She's a tall, pretty, and very well-proportioned girl with a healthy weight. But she hates everything about her body and thinks she looks like a boy. She admitted that social media has ingrained in her certain standards of beauty that she's finding very hard to get over. Help. Hmm. I mean, you hear this often, right? I'm hearing it a lot. And and I'll tell you, Rena, when I was... Worrying over the summer about what might be coming down the pike with teenagers and, you know, what it means to be under COVID-19, I was worrying about anxiety. I was worrying about depression. And we've certainly seen that be, you know, on the rise. I was worrying about substance misuse. And a little bit sort of, you know, further from the center of it for me was eating concerns. And I have to tell you, in the last couple of weeks, I feel like clinically, in terms of what I'm seeing and hearing, what my colleagues are seeing and hearing, Eating concerns have come so much to the fore. And then on top of that, I'm part of a conversation that's on WETA and PBS NewsHour about teens and COVID and um, how their mental health is coming along. The, The link to how to watch is in the show notes. And as part of that, a survey was done asking teenagers, like, what was top of mind? What's the thing that's, you know, what are some of the things that you're really struggling with? The number one thing the teenager said was stressful for them had to do with body image, eating, fitness. And the thing that was so incredible to me, though it lines up with what I'm hearing, the boys were really well represented in this. It was like 55% of the girls said that was their main concern, and 40% of the boys wow. said it was their number one concern. So it's one of those things, Rena, like you know how sometimes like you'll learn a new word and then you sometimes like start hearing it everywhere? Yeah. yeah. I will tell you the last couple of weeks for me clinically, everywhere I turn, eating concerns are coming up. And, and that is wow. definitely worrisome. I didn't realize that the boys represented that you know, 40%, that's huge as well. But, you know, you look at social media, Instagram, whatever it might be, you worry because you can add filters, you can make your way skinnier, you can do a lot of things that don't make reality reality, right? Yeah. But do you, like, what do you think is going on here? Is this because of COVID, because we're locked down? Is it just social media in general that's everyone's having to deal with? Like, what is it really? Well, so I think there's a lot at play, but let's start with the social media piece. Okay, so generally in conversations about social media, I am very slow to blame things on social media. There's a, there's in some ways, I think, an over-blaming of social media for like every bad thing that goes on with teenagers. Yeah, and yeah. we don't really have the data for it. And, you know, so I'm always really cautious and I'm like, oh, it's not all bad. Okay, on this one, I think it's a pretty significant factor. And, and I think there's a couple of things at play. One is... Kids are looking at, like you said, these idealized images or these, you know, kind of curated images, um, very carefully posed images, which they do normally. But normally it's counterbalanced by seeing kids in real life. 
Mm. You know, so I hadn't thought yeah, of that. yeah. So like you know, it, it's one thing if you see a like a kid you know from class, a girl maybe who has really carefully chosen an angle to present herself with, you know, what they do. They spend a lot of time figuring out these angles where they, you know, sort of most flattering, you know, and or, yeah. you know, morphing in one way or another. But then you see her in class and you're like, okay, but she doesn't really look like that. You know, that, that in normal life, there's more of a check against the distortions of social media. So one problem right now is that check is gone. And, and, and I just find it like, I have so much empathy around this because like, you know how, um, Instagram is now pushing reels. Yeah. I think it's like Videos. the Facebook version of TikToks. Yeah. So like there's I've been searching like when I go to search for uh you know somebody on Instagram when I open up the search frame the reels start playing. You know because they're they're it's a new know, product. Yeah. bringing them forward. And the reels are invariably like these darling slim fit oh. young women who are like roller skating or whatever. And it's so strange, Rena, because even at 50 years old, I'm like, oh, I don't look like that. And wow. I mean, just how quickly um, that reflex is to compare. And and so I think here I am at 50. I can't yeah. resist it. Like, what does it mean for a kiddo? We talk about social media. How now do you counter that? What's the solution in dealing with that? Yeah. Okay, so one is, again, like, if you can get your kids to look at other people in person, you know, have their friends over in person, I really think that helps to counterbalance. The other thing that we need to do, and this comes from there's a really smart woman named Jill Walsh who talks about kids in social media and helping them manage, you know, how they take things in, is to have that conversation, to say, look, I mean, yes, that girl looks darling and very slim, but you know and I know, like – what do you think? Like, how long did she spend taking that picture? Like, how long, you know, how much time was put into that image? And and not saying you can't look at it or don't look at it. I don't think that's very realistic. But to do what we can in parenting to insert that filter to get young people, boys and girls, questioning what they mm -hmm. see. Because the other thing I've seen, it was I was actually looking at something. Um, I think I was reading something in the New York Times about some TikTok hype house and they showed a pack of boys who were these, you know, really, I guess, famous TikTokers, mm. all without their shirts on, yeah. all with six packs. Yeah, yeah. And, and I saw that and I thought, okay, here's the boy piece, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we talk so much about the girl piece, but there's also, I think, on social media for the boys to see a lot of young men who are putting forward these very, very, you know, kind of fit physiques. And if that is what you're looking all day at all day and you're not looking at the kid in the class yeah. who just looks like a normal person, yeah. it can start to warp your understanding of how you're supposed to look. Mm. What else do you worry about? Okay, this is going to sound really basic, but it seems to be part of the problem. Kids have too much time on their hands. They, they don't have enough distractions. Oh. Um, it's so interesting clinically, Rena, when I'm talking with kids, something is going through my head that has not usually gone through my head, which is like, oh my gosh, this kid is too much in their head, that they have time to just loop on obsessions almost, you know, things that they're thinking about. They can just go down these rabbit holes and get further and further into them because they're not running off to practice. Mm. They're not over at this house babysitting. True. They're not out and about, you know, trying to figure out how to get something done. There's so much of a narrowing of experience for all of us right now and kids too, that I think, you know, you can almost start to add these up. Number one, they're looking at a lot of social media with a lot of idealized bodies, whether they're real or not. Number two, they have time to just think and think and think about it. And I mean, I'll use the term obsess about it because there's not enough else happening that is pleasantly distracting or even unpleasantly distracting. Their, their lives are narrow. But Lisa, how do I, how do I as a parent counter that? Because things are closed. I can't, soccer is shut down. I, schools might not be open. I, and I need to do my work and, and yeah. feed three meals a day. So how do you counter the lack of distractions? I'm not entirely sure, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> but I think first you name the problem and yeah. that gets you towards solving it. I do think we need to find ways to keep teenagers busy even in the context of the pandemic. And and that's in some ways been a a longstanding truism about teenagers. Like, they're better when they're busy. You know, mm -hmm. it, like, it just kind of mm -hmm. keeps them on the right track and out of trouble if they've got stuff to do. 
And and so maybe the way to think about it is here we are, you know, late October, whatever the rhythm is of school, we probably adapted to it a bit or hopefully yeah. it hasn't changed too much. Like kids are starting to figure it out. Grownups are starting to figure it out. It's new and different, but it's less new and different. Can we start to add things in? Can we start to have kids, you know, do more chores or rake more leaves or, you know, soon shovel more one. snow? <laughs> Good luck. Good luck with that one. <laughs> um, but can we just be attuned to yeah. the fact that they just don't have that much happening yeah. and try to fit in more that just pulls them away from their own heads, which is such a strange thing as a clinician to say, like, I don't want teenagers thinking so much, but yeah. I actually yeah. – I don't want them going down rabbit holes so much, and they unfortunately have time to do it. Even stuff like – um, you know, in school, when they're there, like, there's, like, gossip or kids to talk mm. to or, mm. you know, that funny thing that kid just did in class. You know, just the loss of that um, – is creating space I don't think is always helping teenagers. It's also, you don't have control of so many things at this point, right? Well, that's, I think, another huge piece of this. And and in many ways, a kind of a, a traditional, and it can feel like a little bit of a pop psychology explanation for eating disorders, but I think it's really legitimate here, which is it's something to control. Hmm. And And so... Okay, so first you've got the layer of kids looking at themselves or other kids on social media. Then you've got the layer of too much time to think about themselves, their bodies, how they're looking, how they're going to come out of this pandemic. And then the third is this overall sense that there's too little control, you know, that that things are not going the way they want them to and they can't control a huge amount. And it does. It just, I mean, to use a weird expression here, it sets the table for kids to be like, okay, well, I'm going to take control of this. I have time. I have inclination. And I don't have anything else I feel in great control of. I'm going to whip myself into the best shape of my life or I'm going to eat the purest diet possible. And and it's one of those um, maneuvers that happen psychologically of like, if I can't do that, I'll do this. You know, if I can't control you know, what's happening in my social life, I'll control my body. Mm. And and it's it's problematic because it's reinforcing, you know, that if I feel like, okay, everybody's hanging out without me and I can't do anything about that, but I can eat salad for lunch and that makes me feel better. You know, we have the problem of it being somewhat reinforcing, like, oh, I ate salad and I feel better yeah. about my social life, right? I mean, it, it, it's sort of one of those tricky maneuvers that – um, kids can get themselves in trouble and also grownups too. Yeah, oh, totally. But when I'm hearing you, you talk about, you know, this whole wishing for control as, as one of the explanations uh, with eating disorders. But I, I've got to tell you, like, I try to work out with get the gang in the neighborhood and I feel, I, I can see how this is sort of the only thing I can control in my life that I look forward to. But at the same time, when is it healthy and when is it not? I think working out is right. healthy. It's helping my brain, my mental health. But what, oh, eating a salad every day, what's wrong with that? Right. I mean, and that's actually also where I think it gets very tricky from the standpoint of parents because some parents are worried their kid is not eating all that well and being really lethargic and not getting that much activity. So, you know, if you see your child or teenager taking a lot of initiative around, like, I'm going to eat healthy and I'm going to make sure I'm getting lots of exercise – to a degree, parents are probably like, okay, good. Like you're yeah. on it. You know, yeah. like you're checking that box. I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, and so, so the, you know, the, the broad framework, and, and I, I know we, we raised this in our earlier episode where we talked a little bit about activity. Um, but it's, it's really the right framework is, is your kid taking good care of themselves? You know, and especially teenagers, we can really expect that teenagers see it as their responsibility to take good care of themselves and and just watch that. Right. And so if you see a kid who you feel is getting really controlling around what they eat and their exercise, I would start to call the question and I would call it openly with a teenager. I would say, look, I see that you um, eating less or eating super healthy is a way that you're trying to um, make something work right now when it feels like nothing's working, make something better when it feels like nothing's you know happening the way you want it to happen. But 
I want to make sure you're doing it in a way that really means you're taking good care of yourself, which means not taking it too far. Mm. What really happens in the mind for someone who's struggling from an eating disorder? Is there, can you talk generally about that? Is it different case by case? Oh, it's actually a fascinating question. So part of why eating disorders can be so dangerous is they can kind of lock people in that if a person really starts to restrict and isn't eating enough, what happens is their ability to think in sophisticated ways starts to collapse. And and, and one way to think about it, okay, so say, Rena, say I said to you, okay, I will talk to you in two days, but between now and two days from now, you are only going to eat 500 calories a day. So, you know, very restricted diet. Oh, my gosh. Right? Okay. Yeah. What kind of shape are you going to be in when you and I talk in two week, in two days? I tell you, in six hours, I'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Forget two days. Right? You'll be thinking about nothing but food. Yeah. And we would not be able to have a rounded, thoughtful, sophisticated conversation yes. about anything. Yeah. I'd be angry, absolutely angry at you within six hours. Exactly. So you'd be I'd angry. eat your head off in six hours. Exactly. Angry and very concrete in your thinking, very focused on food only. And so one of the ways that eating disorders can really get a grip on people is in the depletion of nutrition, in the loss of just the sustaining nutrition that we need, people's ability to step back and think, what am I doing? Is this a good idea? Is this really working for me? That actually gets undermined by the lack of nutrition. And so then there can become this very rigid focus on food rules or exercise rules that really can take people down a path that um, is a dangerous one. So that's where we have to be so mindful as parents of teenagers right now, especially teenagers who are doing what may be a perfectly wonderful thing of taking really good care of themselves in terms of how they eat and getting plenty of exercise, I would just say to parents, keep an eye. Keep an eye on, I would say, almost the the flavor of how they're doing it. Like, is it does it feel like this is me loving and taking good care of myself? Or this is me taking what starts to feel like an almost punishing stance mm-hmm. towards myself. You know, I wonder under these COVID situations and eating disorders, so many people have gained the COVID-15 at this point, right? You're Mm -hmm. locked in. How do you make sure you're not forming an unhealthy relationship that then could be transferred over to your kid who might not even have an eating disorder, right? When when do you know you're in trouble? Well, I, I think like if we go with that idea, you know, do we see food and exercise or food and activity as part of how we tend to ourselves or part of how we are hard on ourselves, right? Restricting and high standards for exercise or, I mean, that word punishing really feels like it fits the bill here. You know, is this how we are trying to keep ourselves in line as opposed to, I feel good when I eat this way, I feel good when I get this much activity. I would just watch that. But we also know what parents say matters. Mm -hmm. So, it's not just the kids and the teenagers who I think are having um, to renegotiate their relationship with food and exercise and activity because we all are because we're in such a different setting than we're used to. So I would have parents also be cautious about mm-hmm. how they talk about their body, how they talk mm-hmm. about their eating, mm-hmm. and and really go out of your way to try to model a sense of this is me tending to myself as opposed to this is me taking myself to task. Mm. So you've walked us through why you think there may be a rise in eating disorders under COVID right now. And you mentioned social media. Second thing was lack of distractions. And the third was a wish for control. Is there anything else that you think might explain why we might be seeing an uptick? Okay, so this is a little vaguer, but I have a very strong Scooby sense about it, I guess, (laughs) as you would say. Um, This is such a hard time to be a teenager. They are School is so weird and so hard, no matter how they're doing it. They do not get to see their friends like they're supposed to and used to. And and it's becoming a bit normed. Like we're sort of getting used to this idea of like, yeah, school is looking at a computer and seeing your friends is like this, you know, tough negotiation. And what I worry in the kind of adapting to it, the normalization of it, 
is that we can forget how crummy this is for teenagers. And then we can do something which is really easy to do, which is to sort of flex on teenagers when they don't like it. You know, so when a kid is like, oh, my God, I can't do one more Zoom meeting, it's very easy as a parent to be like, well, you know, it's important that you stay on top of things this year. Um, you know, or a kid's like, I really want to see my friends, you know, for mm-hmm. an adult to be like, well, you know, we have to be very careful. And and we can do that. And well-behaved teenagers will sort of put their head down and go along with that. But part of what I've worried about is they're still really mad. And, and what we're asking them to do should be making them mad. Actually, anger is a very appropriate reaction right now to what we're asking of teenagers. But not all teenagers can or will get outwardly angry. Some will. Some will misbehave. Some will, you know, really go toe-to-toe with the parent. But I think let's work with the assumption that all teenagers are deeply unhappy, if not angry, about what we're asking of them right now, and rightly so. But some, rather than taking it out on the world, are going to take it out on themselves. And so my other concern is that kids who are angry, may manage that anger by pointing it against themselves and being like, well, I'm going to then get myself, you know, into good shape and only eat healthy foods and really take, again, I'm going to use this word again, a punishing stance toward themselves. Mm. I think that dynamic may be quite a bit at play, to Mm. be honest. Interesting. So bottom line, as we wrap it up here, what should parents really look out for? Well, I think... Watch to make sure, you you know, watch your kid's relationship with food. But I would also say on this last point, take the initiative to talk with your kid about how pissed they must be. You know, whether Mm. or not they're articulating it, don't let them point it in. (laughs) Help them point it out, right? Right. So, so, you know, even as your wonderful, diligent daughter or son, if you have one who's sitting down and just, you know, making it work anyway, doing the schoolwork under these terrible conditions anyway – take the initiative to say, look, buddy, I watch what you're doing and you're doing an amazing job, but like this stinks and you've got to be really frustrated or really annoyed that this is how it's going down. Or I can't believe we have to negotiate whether or not you can see your friends. Like we we have to figure out something safe, but buddy, like I don't want to miss for a minute that this is unfair and not okay for you. Don't let the ugly piece of this go unaddressed. I would name it. I would try to help the kids say it. Because if it's not going out, if it's not pointed out, that aggression, that frustration can be pointed in. And that is not a good situation for kids. And on your point about focusing on on other things and sort of other distractions, charity could potentially be a good distraction. And we have a new series that we launched called For Children Everywhere. And we're going to mention a charity that we love and an opportunity for you to talk to your family about maybe donating. And these charities don't know that we're mentioning them. So, and we get nothing out of it. It's just what Lisa's always said, giving back really helps people. And the charity we've decided is we're talking about food. One that I love is World Central Kitchen by Chef Jose Andres. They are doing amazing work providing emergency food relief, trying to keep small kitchens uh, up and open. And during election, I found out they're going to be feeding people in the poll lines. They said they don't care who you vote for. They just want to make sure you don't leave the polls and you cast your ballots. They are helping in disaster relief areas. So we want to give a shout out to them, provided more than 25 million meals since 2013. If you want to help fight hunger, World Central Kitchen. And we'll put the information in the show notes too. Yes. Every week we put the information on the charity in the show notes, which is on the description of where you're getting your podcast. And we're also going to mention Wellbeing. That's a show that Lisa will be on, WDETA, PBS NewsHour. More information in the description. So what's your parenting to go, Lisa? So my parenting to go is about when kids are pointing it outward, (laughs) um, are pointing their frustration outward. And it's about complaining. And complaining is part of being a kid and a teenager. And it's For me, not that big a deal. It's sort of how kids manage to be really well-behaved everywhere else as they come home and complain a lot. And what I am finding and hearing is, okay, complaining is a lot right now. Kids are complaining a lot. If they're not, you know, just sucking it all up, they are complaining a lot. And there are two phrases that I think all parents should have handy for when their kid starts complaining. So the first one is, 
do you want my help or do you just need to vent? Huh. It's really useful because usually the kid will say, I just need to vent. And then the parent can sit back and see the complaining as a way that the kid is unloading the burdens of the day and then just walking away from them. And usually the kid feels much better. And knowing that the kid just needed to vent, the parent doesn't feel like they were supposed to have done something. <laughs> if the parent's feeling like maybe more needs to be done, my other favorite phrase is to say, is there anything I can do that won't make this worse? And it's a real light touch. It's a way of saying, I can tolerate that you're unhappy. I also can tolerate there may not be much I can do to fix things, but I'm here. I'm, I'm trying to be creative. And those two phrases address a great deal of the kind of end of day distress that kids bring our way. You always teach us how to rethink things that I think are huge problems that you just want to go away. And sometimes it's in the language. You got to have the right phrase. And, and I think that's so much of what you learn in your training as a psychologist. Like the theory is one thing, but like the words to say it, that's another. So having the words to say it does make it easier. Absolutely love it. I will see you next week, Lisa. See you next week. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Ask Lisa podcast so you get the episodes just as soon as they drop. And send us your questions to asklisa at drlisademore.com. And now a word from our lawyers. The advice provided on this podcast does not constitute or serve as a substitute for professional psychological treatment, therapy, or other types of professional advice or intervention. If you have concerns about your child's well-being, consult a physician or mental health professional. If you're looking for additional resources, check out Lisa's website at drlisademore.com. We'll see you next week.